Hi, I'm Jocelyn Sargent again from the High Oaks Foundation, and uh, we are on our second day of this incredible conference, Rethinking Racial Justice in the Wake of Obama and the Era of Trump. Um, yesterday afternoon, we had a great session with, um, I'm going to read everybody's name so I don't forget it, with Rachel Gilmer of the Dream Defenders, with Mary Hooks from Southerners on Newground, and many of these people are in the room so you can talk to them here too. Um, then Tinjue McHarris from uh, Blackbird, uh, which is, and also, oh, the movement for Black Lives. And she spent a lot of time in Ferguson. Somehow I missed that. I don't know how. But anyway, so lots to talk about. Um, and then it was moderated by Asha Ransby Sporn, who is the director of organizing at BYP 100. It was an incredible, enlightening session. I felt uh, renewed hope. And I am not an optimist, so I felt <laughs> renewed hope. And just a lot of energy and just gratitude for such an incredible panel. So no pressure on the panelists today, <laughs> which I am not going to turn it over to, but I'm going to turn it over to Barbara Ransby. Barbara Ransby and Kathy Cohen, who's on the panel right now, they were the, this event is their brainchild, and they have brought together an incredible group of activists, scholars, organizers, and you know, just interested, interested good folk. I'm going to turn it over to Barbara right now to introduce the panel. Thank you. Um, Tracy's probably going to uh, kind of introduce the panel, but I'm going to introduce Tracy. But I also just want to um, say that Kathy and I um, kind of co-planned this, um, and we are indebted to the Highlands Foundation and our friend Jocelyn Sargent for her vision in seeing the importance and the value uh, of this kind of gathering. People should know that it's being live streamed, so the audience is actually bigger than the folks in this room, but we thought an intimate setting for reflection, debate, discussion about critical issues across different organizations, sectors, and silos uh, was a really important uh, thing to do at this, what we see as a very urgent political um, moment. So um, Scholars for Social Justice is an organization that um, Kathy and I Kathy with a big frown. Am I yeah, we read each other's facial expressions for communication. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, Scholars for Social Justice is an organization of activist scholars committed to doing thinking, collaborative, analytical work outside the confines of the university uh, with our colleagues and comrades who are in struggle on frontline organizations. Um, and that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're doing something about reparations in higher ed, um, as well as gatherings like this. So uh, we are very um, happy to be doing this, happy to be partnering with Hyams. Um, really honored for this panel, but yesterday's panel was absolutely amazing with people we consider young people. They may consider there's some young people younger than them, of course there is, but, uh, but with a panel of, of young activists and thinkers who really um, were powerful, provocative, passionate, um, all that good stuff. I just want to also say something about the venue. Uh, so this is some people's first day here and in these kind of rarefied environments, a little creepy in some level. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but Martha's Vineyard really has a much longer uh, history and, and has a longer reach than Edgartown. Really the heart of the vineyard is uh, Oak Bluffs, where it is um, a large black population. Some people stay here all year round, but some come, you know, for the summer. And this has been for a long time. Um, I did some work on Islanda Robeson, you know, who was a, a radical intellectual internationalist. She came here from, for refuge um, and community uh, back when, you know, the government was, was taking her passport away and um, tracking her and her husband down for their left-wing beliefs. Dorothy West, the um, a rebellious writer, uh, convened people here on Martha's Vineyard to talk about how to challenge you know, racism and white supremacy. Um, and Dorothy Burnham, who we had with us yesterday, who's 102 years old, uh, partner to Louis Burnham, uh, very much involved in um, radical and progressive black politics in the early, early 20th century. So, um, so it has a history, there's a history of bringing people together. We see particularly bringing activists to this space as kind of democratizing some of the conversations that happen here. Many of you know there have been many conversations already on the vineyard, but we think this one is very special uh, because of all of you, because of the people who've, who've convened here. So thank you for being here on this very, very beautiful summer day. Uh, this panel will make it worth your while. 
Moderator uh, Tracy Matthews is a filmmaker and historian, has done work on uh, Women in the Black Panther Party, uh, recently had a film at the Martha's Vineyard Film Festival on the 63 student boycott uh, in Chicago, and is a very, very powerful thinker, activist, organizer in her own right. And, most importantly, it is her birthday today. <laughs> So you know her sister's committed and she's up here moderating a panel on her new day. So we love her and I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you, Barbara. Okay. Thank you everyone for the birthday wishes. Um, so we're going to get started here. Um, again, I'm Tracy Matthews. I work at the University of Chicago at the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. And as Barbara said, I'm a historian, so when Kathy asked me to moderate this panel, I was like, what? <laughs> I'm a historian and math hole. You have that in. So I, I expect to learn a lot from this panel, and I'm going to ask the questions that the other math folks in the audience want to have answered. Um, so we're going to start out by having um, each speaker introduce themselves. So we have um, Adrian Shropshire from, did I say that right, Shropshire? Shire, Executive Director of Black Pack. We have Yeshi Milner, Executive Director and Founder of Data for Black Lives. And we have Kathy Cohen, uh, who's a professor and she's the uh, PI for the Gen Forward Survey Projects and also Scholarship for Justice convener. Um, so each person take maybe about five minutes and talk about the work you do and um, how you see this political moment and has your work changed at all um, under this current administration from what it was previously. We'll start with you, Adrian. That's okay. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Happy birthday, Tracy. Thank you. Um, so I'm Adrian, uh, and I uh, run an organization called Black Pack, um, and it's related affiliated uh, C4, Black PAC is a, uh, a super PAC. Um, and we have a related C4 called the Black Progressive Action Coalition. Um, so our work really grows out of a conversation, or Black PAC actually, um, grows out of a conversation from three years ago, I guess now, um, where that was about, fundamentally about um, uh, Black political infrastructure. Um, and uh, a question or a series of questions that I know I had and a lot of the folks that I had worked with for many years around the country um, had about um, what kind of black political infrastructure do we have? <laughs> and, um, and particularly, um, what did we have and what, did, what was missing um, coming out of you know eight years of um, the Obama era, uh, both his uh, two campaigns um, as well as his two terms, there was this question around what had been built uh, in terms of um, sustainable black political infrastructure. Um, and so we began to convene some folks to actually to have this conversation, uh, both about the work that people had been doing um, in building independent political organizations, um, some questions that we had around, um, you know, sort of black progressive movement um, and its relationship to and the role of legacy organizations, um, and frankly, the recognition of the gaps that existed um, as we were moving into this era that was, that was you know, um, post the moment when for many people in this country, many black folks in this country in particular, um, saw as the height of our political, uh, where, where the, our political expression could take us, right, to the White House. Um, and we can argue about that point. Um, mm -hmm. But there was this question about could we sustain, right? Could we sustain the engagement um, of black communities, both in elections, but obviously um, people's lives are not uh, just about an election day. Um, and so could we sustain the high levels of, uh, of voter participation, um, but could we also make sure that we kept uh, that? Well, many of the things that folks talked about on the panel yesterday. Um, so we have, these, we have this conversation, and the end result was um, that it was important for 
there to be an entity, we weren't sure what it was going to be, that had, that had the ability to actually be expressly political. Um, that it was, uh, it could be a, about elections, it could be about mobilizing our people, it could be about mobilizing our people around issues, it could, it could provide scale. Um, and then um, there was this sort of debate about, well, so where do we begin? And there was one set of folks that were like, well, we need to start with an agenda. Um, Charlene, you might remember this. We need an agenda. And we did this long process of coming up with an agenda. And then there was another set that was like, actually, we need to begin with research because it's not, it's not, uh, it's not sufficient for us to, uh, to put out what we believe are the most important issues um, before we have a conversation. Um, with our community about what the most important issues are, um, and so um, and so that one of the what what we sort of walked away with was that one of the main things that we could actually do and offer um, to our partners was um, research um, and communication, and part of that was because um, it's just expensive. Like no one has money to be doing polls and, and focus groups. Forget about it, right? Um, so it's expensive and it was a need to sort of think about how to, is, was there a way that we could sort of provide this public utility in a way? Um, and then could we take that information that we were learning and really think about then how we were having conversations with um, the people that we knew we needed to talk to? Um, and not just the like, can we shape the message, right? Um, like what's the, what's the message that we're going to say to people at the doors, but really how do we use this to have substantive conversations um, and then certainly use those substantive conversations to frame what was going on our mail and what was going in our digital ads and all that, that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, um, what I think we recognize, and I certainly recognize, it is in um, the actual conversations that we're having in our communities that we're going to, um, you know, sort of correct ourselves to get to your, the, your question about how's our work changed, sort of correct ourselves back on a path toward um, progress in this country. Um, and so I think for us, our work hasn't changed because we actually didn't exist during the last administration. <laughs> um, uh, we were, in many ways, I think about, it, it, you know, we were sort of, um, you know, born for this moment in a way. Um, I think that certainly what, what happened coming out of the 2016 election for us um, was a recognition that um, not only we, but everyone else needed to be engaging in our communities differently than they had been. Um, and that they needed to be thinking about, um, you know, not simply, and certainly we know about the sort of taking our grants for voted and all that kind of stuff, um, but it was deeper than that, right? It was deeper than just taking our grants um, or our votes for granted. And I think that we sometimes do too, right? And so um, we, you know, sort of went through a process of saying like, well, this, you know, we, we actually didn't do what we said we were created to do was make sure that we don't see drop off in the black vote. Um, and so what does that mean? Did we do something that did we do something wrong? And I think we came away saying, no, we did not. <laughs> but a whole bunch of folks did in terms of who they think we are um, and how they think it is appropriate to engage with us. Um, so, um, so I think uh, I'll stop there. But so the, the sort of research became a, a, and I'm not a data scientist, so if people were hoping to geek out with me, <laughs> I'm not the one. <laughs> um, but it, 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 you know, research has become a central part of our work because it is how we understand both our, what we are doing, it is how we develop our strategies, and it is how we develop the conversations again um, that we're having both in our community when we're on the doors, it's the conversations that we explore and expand upon with our partners, um, and it's the way that we can, that we can go to um, you know, the uh, Democratic Party infrastructure and say you're way off track. Um, you're way off track and you're, you're actually going to cause problems for us because you're so far off track. Um, so that's, that's how we come to research. Thank you, Adrian. My name is Yeshi. I am the um, founder and executive director of Data for Black Lives. We are a movement of uh, 4,000 scientists and activists committed to using data to make concrete and measurable change in the lives of black people. Um, we started about two years ago. Uh, we launched with a conference at the MIT Media Lab. Um, it was amazing. It sold out and it really kind of indicated to me that this conversation that I've been having with folks and that people have been having nationally um, really, really, really had become prime time and that it was important for us to not only build a movement but an institution behind it as well. Um, even though we launched two years ago, Data for Black Lives really comes out of 
my personal experiences, um, the very first time I ever collected data was actually in high school, as a high school student. Um, it was the year 2008 in Miami, Florida. Some young people at a neighboring high school um, had reached out to me because they had been organizing a peaceful protest because a school administrator had put another student in a headlock. And this was around 2008. We didn't have like the nice videos. I mean, certainly, you know, b before some of the mainstream attention around police brutality, um, and certainly very little attention to what was happening in schools, especially the state, the state mentioned violence that was happening in schools in cities like Miami. Um, so instead of these young people's, um, you know, they, they had organized this peaceful protest and, and instead of it being received as, you know, great, thank you guys for being leaders, you know, the ways in which thankfully now young people are encouraged to walk out and take a stand. Um, the city, the school department, and actually um, uh, the, the whole school board administration sent in police officers, SWAT teams, police cars, and if you look on YouTube right now and you Google Ryan at Miami Edison Senior High, you'll see the CNN clip, right? So imagine me being in high school, I'm watching CNN and seeing young people that I went to elementary school with, middle school, literally being slammed against police cars. Seeing young people um, you know, who I knew were good kids and who wanted to have their voices heard, um, literally you know, being brutalized. And um, that's when I joined an organization called Power Youth Center for Social Change. Yes, woo, thank you. And we hit the ground running, right? We, we started collecting data. We collected over 600 surveys asking young people about their experiences with um, police, brut police brutality, but also with suspensions and arrests in schools. Young people were being suspended for things like not having an ID, wearing the wrong color t-shirt. I mean, I once had like a three-day suspension in the sixth grade in computer class, ironically, because I was talking out of turn, right? So that's the response that has been the response to young black people who are interested in science and math and STEM, um, in, in, in particular in cities like Miami. So we actually hit the ground running, we collected these 600 surveys, and we actually turned that into a comic book. And even though it took many years for us to make any traction in Miami, and I know Jamie Furniture and folks are still here, still trying to work on getting restorative justice in schools, it was so inspiring to see that young people in Chicago, in New Orleans, in Denver, um, even in, I heard a couple weeks ago, Knoxville, Tennessee, had used our comic book, right? Because there was no existing data until the Obama administration, Office of Civil Rights, big data release, where um, that really broke down um, the school to prison pipeline and the ways it was really impacting young people. So I think for me, um, that was my introduction to organizing, direct action organizing, but that was also what really kind of put the battery in my back around data. I was like, wow, we can use data to reflect the voices of people who are being silenced, who have absolutely no voice, which in particular were young black people, right? And unless we found different ways to get our voices heard, our lives would continue to be under assault. So I went to college and my focus was to get as much skills and you know expertise in data collection analysis as possible. Um, and I graduated and I got an opportunity to go right back to Miami, um, but this time, um, in addition to working on the school to prison pipeline work, I was asked to lead a campaign around black infant mortality. And here's the truth, you know, we, we, we had a grant from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, that was our last grant, and it, it was up to me to finish the deliverable so that we could keep our doors open, right? So let's talk about the lack of funding for black organizing, right? So, you know, I said, okay, well, I have all these fancy skills. I can go and finish this survey very easily, but we need to actually use this data as a tactic. So what was happening in Miami is happening nationwide is black babies are three times more likely to die before their first birthday. Um, we, moms in the community, we all knew, women, we all knew that, especially at our public hospital, Jackson Hospital, um, that's where a lot of the abuses were happening, right? Whether it was the aggressive targeting and marketing of infant formula, the overuse of procedures like cesarean section, um, and just a totally kind of racist environment that like made pregnancy an illness and like medicalized birth, right? Having conversations in Overtown in Miami where they talked about when midwives were our primary, primary care doctors, people survived better, right? So what did we do, right? After, you know, I came onto this campaign at the very end, and after years of even just trying to get on the hospital's radar, right, continually being ignored, we were even kicked out of like the Florida Breastfeeding Coalition um, meetings, right? Because I didn't realize that, you know, 
uh, infant formula was so political until I realized that it was a $38 trillion industry, right? So, you know, again, we said, how can we get a better sense of what's happening on the ground? How can we reflect the voices of moms um, who are going into the hospitals and leaving without their baby, right? How can we reflect the voices of families who are losing mothers? So we collected 300 surveys asking moms about their experiences in hospitals. Um, we developed that survey with amazing uh, folks from um, Loyola Marymount University that was provided by Robert Wood Johnson Grant. Um, and I took all that data, took out all that analysis. It was me, an intern, Annie, who is I think now at, at Project South. Yeah. And um, like three or four moms that I got from like, you know, I like signed up at the workforce office to, to have, to make art or an internship site. And somehow they let me do that. But you know, we, we um, right, so we collected these 300 surveys. I wrote a report called A Call for Birth Justice in Miami and literally got one Miami Herald article and the next day the hospital called, right? And part of that was realizing that A, you know, their strat their reputation is their bread and butter. Um, so we went into the meeting with them and they said, wow, like, first of all, did you guys collect all this data yourself? We said, absolutely, yes, we did. And because of that data, because of the report, be, be, because of us amplifying what was happening on the ground, even with 300 moms, um, the hospital absolutely transformed their policies. They adopted the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative. They ended the um, uh, aggressive marketing of infant formula. And most importantly now, they said, before we introduce a new policy, we're gonna go to the community first. And so for me, that was my second experience of saying, wow, this is the power of putting data in the hands of people who are directly impacted. Putting data in the hands of grassroots leaders, black women, black leaders, young people who already know the solutions, who already have uh, demands, who already have a vision for what these communities need, right? And what does it mean for us to use data as a way to kind of push the needle in? You know, um, that for me, that's really the basis of Data for Black Lives. I left Miami, I went to go work at colorofchange.org, and my job there was to um, help build out uh, Organize For, which is the first online petition platform um, for uh, black organizers and, and black communities. And it, it was there realizing, wow, look at how we're able to really, really amplify work on the ground by taking the Color Changes playbook. And again, putting it in the hands, putting these digital activism tactics in the hands of people. Look at how we're able to use this amazing live testing environment that we have at Color of Change with over one million members. But at the same time, you know, I'm again experiencing data. My relationship to data is liberatory. It's, I have this experience of using it on the ground to really change conditions, to build consciousness. But we were also experiencing Cambridge Analytica. That was happening right then, you know? The, weaponiz the weaponization of data through FICO credit scores, through risk assessments, right? You know, efforts to militarize schoolyards and borders through facial recognition technology, right? So I was, there was these two realities, and at the same time, I think because of the political moment around Trump, so many folks that I knew, right, I knew the organizers and activists on the ground who, you know, were in perfect positions to use data as a powerful tactic, but I also knew folks like my co-founder, Lucas, who, who was just finishing up his PhD in math at MIT, young people that I knew were working in tech companies, a lot of black scientists who wanted to do more, right, who believed in math, who was passionate about math, who believed in science, but didn't want to see it being weaponized the way that it historically has and, and continues to be. So for me, it made sense. What would it look like for us to break down these silos between the black community and the scientific community? What does it look like to build bridges between scientists and activists? And um, that's where the Data for Black Lives Movement comes out of, right? Two years after our first conference, we've had you know, two more sold out conferences. We've been able to raise over $3 million. We've been able to impact the conversation around, you know, Facebook and voter suppression and big data nationally. We've been able to support local work around dissolving big data agreements in cities like St. Paul, partnering with folks in Houston, Texas around how do we use evidence-based policing, which has been weaponized against our communities to then hold police accountable. But I think most importantly, what we've been able to do is really build a network of folks who are equipped with the technical skills, with the vision and the empathy to not only make data um, a tool for social change, but really make it a blueprint um, for liberation, for justice, and to really address 
uh, this kind of neoliberal logic that we're existing under and to build something totally new. So thank you all for having me. And Jocelyn, I have to say something. When we first did our conference, uh, we one of the first people we went to for sponsorships was Himes Foundation. And Jocelyn, you know, you could have thought we were crazy for what we were talking about. I'm not even sure, but you cut that check and you had <laughs> yeah. you made sure we had what we needed yeah. to have our first conference. So I when I got this invite, I knew I had to come because if it wasn't for y'all's leadership, Kathy, your work, Joss, we wouldn't be here. So thank you. Wow, that was it. How's everybody doing? All right. All right. That, I know, it's a lot, isn't it? It's, it's you're full, it's great. Uh, Jocelyn, you cutting checks, huh? <laughs> you all don't know, Jocelyn loves data. That's part of it. Um, as both Barb and Tracy said, I'm Kathy Cohen. I'm part of Scholars for Social Justice. Um, you know, I love black people. I almost love data as much as I love black people. And I, and I love data about black people, uh, the liberation of black people. I see you frowning, Barb, it's okay. Uh, I am an academic by profession, but I like to think in my heart I'm an activist. And it is. Your microphone is on. Can you make a switch? Because that was going in and out. Hello, hello. Do you want me closer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was saying I'm an academic, uh, an academic by profession, but in my heart uh, I'm an activist, and it is the activism. Uh, there's, there's one. Here's one here too. Hello. Okay. Uh, it's just how I'm holding it. Okay. <laughs> but I'd like to think that in fact it is the activism that shapes how I think about data. So you know, there's a because I'm older, there's a long history of activism. There's an activism around HIV and AIDS in black communities when folks didn't want to recognize it or talk about it. We built an organization called Black AIDS Mobilization. I was a part of the group of people who built um, Audre Lorde Project. Yeah. Uh, I was on the board of Kitchen Table Women of Color Press. We're now doing Scholars for Social Justice. The reason I mention this is that all of that activism is about making visible the complexity of black people, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think when we think about data, data should be doing the same thing, right? It is about when we say, and we all say our people, what do we mean by our people, right? Because there's just such deepness and complexity there. That also comes from my black feminism, right? Because I think the work that we should be engaged in is right, always highlighting, focusing on work that brings folks from, as Bell might say, the margins to the center. Right, Like any black feminist, I want to destroy and replace systems of oppression. I want to build fair, equitable, and democratically controlled systems of governance. I want to build a world where people's joy and intimacy is understood to be a public good that must be protected and promoted. Right, That, it seems to me, is our work as activists, and so we have to use data to, to move us towards that kind of stream of liberation. So for me, data is about liberation. It is about imagining and conjuring up who is our public and who is our people. Who is worthy of us listening to and recognizing? And, and for me, um, if we think about the way data, and I would argue polling has taken on maybe a much more significant role in the world, in particular of the press and the media, it has so much to do with the 24-hour media, and they need content. And much of that content increasingly focuses on polls. They conjure up a public that feels that 54% believe that and 53% believe that. But largely, that public doesn't include significant numbers of black people in their polls and very few young black people. And the goal, at least, of our work through both the Black Youth Project and also this project called Gen Forward is to recreate what we think is the public. To recreate and to imagine into existence our people and to say that our people are worthy of being counted and listened to. And there's a distinction sometimes I think that we also wanna make between data about, right? And data that originates from, right? And there's, in the academy, there's a lot of data about and it's usually about pathologizing black people. 
And so what we're trying to do is to create data that is from the voices, the experiences, the ideas, the preferences of black people with a focus for our work on young black people. And I say this all the time, and Tracy, are you keeping time? I, I, I lost sight of when we started, okay. Um, that when I, I'm from Toledo, Ohio, working class family, we'd go home for holidays, and I would sit with my nieces and nephews, and they had such deep insights about kind of neoliberalism. They didn't call it neoliberalism, but they had deep insights about neoliberalism. They had deep insights about the kind of system of mass incarceration that they were facing and living with and trying to exist through, right? Um, but they didn't necessarily call it kind of mass incarceration. And there was a way in which all of the articles talked about them without thinking about or centering their experiences, their perspectives, and their solutions. And so for me, the work of Data for Liberation is to center young black people and to respect the expertise that they have over their own lived experience. Now, having said that, that is not to say that I believe whatever people articulate is where we need to be, right? So part of what data is supposed to do for us is to tell us where we are and where we want to move people, right? So there are, in particular, three things that we try to do with our work. And some of this folks talked about yesterday. One is we want to engage in narrative shift. And I think uh, Tenjiwe talked about this. We want to engage in narrative shift at the grassroots and at maybe what we would call the cultural, right? So yes, we try to get our data into kind of the mass of the press, the Washington Posts, the New York Times. We're trying to shift the ways in which people talk about and think about young folks of color, in particular young black people. And when I'm saying young black people, it's really not young, it's 18 to 36. So some of y'all in the room who I know are 36, I'm calling you young people. Um, we're trying to also seed a new generation of scholars committed to doing work in pursuit of liberation with the use of data, right? So how do we uh, encourage grad students to write different types of dissertation in partnership with people who are on the ground doing work, right? The third thing that we are trying to do through Gen Forward and BYP is to provide data that informs our, both our electoral and organizing strategies. And I have to say, this at times has been more difficult, in particular our organizing strategies. It has been difficult to get organizers to use the types of data that we're producing. Now part of that I think, and I would argue, is about capacity and infrastructure. If you have an organizing uh, entity, you may not have thought in terms of capacity is that I need people who can handle data, right? And we've got to figure out what does an infrastructure look like so that as we're producing data that can inform your strategies, we can help you with that data and we can make sure that the questions that we include inform the strategies that you're engaged in. So let me, I, I know I've got probably one minute. I'm gonna just say something about what we do with Gen Forward. I'm, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna declare, Gen Forward is the best data. <laughs> it's true. Better than Pew, yeah. better than all those, on young people yeah. in this country. It is 3,000 respondents, 18 to 36, we're in the field, meaning we're producing data every other month. Why is it to me, so that, and by itself it means it has small margins of error, you don't wanna know all this, small margins of error, it's good data. But why is it to me more important? It's more important because you have a black feminist lesbian leading that project who has certain types, yay, and certain types of political commitments, that's all. And so what we do is there are about 60 questions on each survey about 20 of those questions are traditional politics questions. Yep, yep, yep. Do you approve of the president? Who are you gonna vote for? And I can talk more about that in a minute. But it also includes a battery of questions on our last survey on criminal justice, reimagining criminal justice that we could just give to you, right? We have done uh, questions on the nature of work. We've done questions on LGBT issues. We've done questions on feminism on healthcare, on mass incarceration, right? So all of the work that folks are doing, we actually have data that we wanna to give to you. Questions on reparations, right? And again, it's not to say this is where we are permanently. It is to say 
where are we and where are we moving? I'm going to say, what? Well, you want me to stop? Can I just say, what? Well, can I just tease something? Can I tease something? Yes, you can. Thank you, Tracy. So if you ask me the question, I'm going to tell you, for example, we're further along on socialism among young black people than most people want to give us credit for. If you ask them, who do you, what do you feel more favorable towards, socialism or capitalism, what do they say? Socialism. Now, yet they may not understand socialism, and when we when we ran that data, every person on the right wing came after us saying, "You crazy young people! They don't know what about Venezuela, what?" But I'm saying, and I can give you more data, which I will, that says young black people in in particular are positioned and ready to hear the message about socialism, to hear an anti-capitalist argument as long as it's in a way that they can understand it and see themselves in it, right? And we have that data that allow you to frame your argument, right, to push back on these people who say, oh, that's radical or that's ridiculous. You got a little data and then you can keep moving and keep organizing. Yes. All right, I'll stop Great. it. Thank you. <laughs> I have so many questions to ask each of you, like basic <laughs> questions that may be too simple, but I was wondering, Adrian, if you could talk a little bit about how Black PAC is preparing um, for the next election cycle, for this election cycle, and what kinds of um, uh, projects, what kinds of questions you're asking, and how you intend to use the information that you gather in your, in your campaign. Um, so I would say that this, in, in many ways, um, how we're approaching this cycle uh, in terms of how we're trying to understand the electorate isn't much different from how we have approached it since 2017, I would say, right? And so um, what I mean by that is, um, you know, sort of what Kathy was saying is that we certainly um, also ask um, the kinds of questions that we know we need to have about where people are on uh, an election, where people are on the horse race, as they say, right? Like, what candidates, right, are you leaning toward? Why are you leaning toward them, that sort of thing? Um, but we also try and understand, both in our polling and also in our focus groups, um, what are the obstacles to people's participation, right? Why is it that, um, you know, someone would say, I know this election is important, I just don't know if I'm going to show up, right? Um, why is it that, or how is it, what, is the, is, what are the disconnects between what people express as, um, you know, uh, some optimism around what we might be able to do as a community, uh, but don't connect that to um, what electoral engagement, how electoral engagement might actually get us toward those things. Um, so we try and understand both the, like what is the, motiv the motivations for um, civic participation, not just the motivation for elections, right? For showing up and pulling the lever or whatever it is that you do these days. Um, so the, our questions are both about, uh, right now, it is about how, what are the, the sort of how do people link issues, right? So not just what are the, um, what are the most important issues, which we certainly want to know, but how are people connecting those issues? Because for us, it allows us, again, it allows us to connect the conversation and not just to show up at someone's door and say, yeah, we know you think the economy is bad, yeah. right? Because the, because because it is, and people say that, um, but, but people also have a very clear analysis about why it is bad, right? And so that is the, for me, that's the substance of the conversations we need to be having, because it then helps us to say, and so let's talk about then what we, what we do, right? Like how does, this, how does this moment, right, allow us to move forward um, in, in sort of making the change that we wanna make? So we wanna understand the connectivity of the issue. So in our, you know, in our most recent um, poll, um, and consistently, right? So I think that yes, black voters are not a monolith, which we hear all the time and we all know to be true in the work that we do, but there are some things um, that we have found some consensus around, right, um, on issues. And so certainly it is, there is some prioritization of issues that we've seen over the last two years. We certainly try and track to see if those same things are still true, but we know that there are some critical issues for black folks and they're mostly the issues that are concerns for everybody else too, right? So it is the economy and it is healthcare um, and it is criminal justice reform and police accountability and climate. Um, but there is this overarching issue that since we started doing our work and certainly since the early part of 2017, 
that ties all that together for black folks and that's racism, mm -hmm. right? And so black people make the connections between how racism affects um, our position in the economy. They make the connections between uh, race and, and disparities in the healthcare system. Right, and so it is, and, I, and this, this is important, and being able to elevate that is important because it is the reason why, in this particular primary, we have candidates making those connections too, right? Putting forward platforms and plans and programs that address the connectivity of the issues that are challenging us. That didn't happen just because candidates decided that they suddenly understood, right, our deep pain, right? It has happened because there has been some narrative shift. That, um, that progressive and democratic candidates have had to take into account starting in 2017, right? When they began to change what they said was the most important thing to do to win elections, right? So folks will remember they said the most important thing to do was to go after uh, white working class and rural voters coming out of 2016. We all remember this because it was so shocking. Right? <laughs> that can't be what your takeaway was, really. Um, and by the end of 2017, that narrative had shifted because elections had been won on the strength of voters of color and black voters in particular, saying, here is what we care about most, right? We care about the rise in racism and white supremacy that we're seeing in this country. We care about disparities across all of these issues, and we want to know how you're going to fix that. Not just how you're going to help me you know, get a job, but how are you going to fix the fact that across our community, um, it is racism that is affecting whether or not we experience economic mobility. So we are looking to, to identify the connections um, there. Um, we're also trying to understand, like, again, this question about what is it that prevents people from participating. So one of the things that I, you know, that I, I'm always concerned about when we say, you know, first of all, there's always this sort of young people. Young people don't vote. Young people, right? And it, you know, it, one of the things that we that we the reason why focus groups are so important to us, like I, I love our polls and I love getting into cross tabs and all that kind of stuff. But what I like about focus groups is that you actually pull out what's underneath what people are saying in the polls, right? Um, and so one of the most important, so sort of profound moments um, in one of our focus groups last year, and we've had many over the years. I mean, the, the two that stand out, I'll give you two little, and I'll stop. One was um, when we first started doing um, focus groups, and we, um, uh, in 2017, maybe it was even 20, it was the beginning of 20, 2016, I think. Um, and we asked people, um, what they thought about um, the term black power. And um, and there was, you know, as you can imagine, there was a range, right? Some people were like, with it. Some people were like, you can't say that ever anywhere. Um, and so there was this one focus group, and it was women, it was black women. And this, and one of the, you know, they were going back and forth and tussling over this concept of could we use black power um, in how we talk to our community. And this one woman just started crying. And, which I had never seen in a focus group before, um, just started crying and she said, why can't we have black power, mm -hmm. right? Why can't we, why are we so afraid to talk about having power for our community? And it was fascinating to watch the group shift because they hadn't asked that question. They were more thinking about what are other people gonna think and what the white folks are gonna be mad, right? Um, and so, but they hadn't thought like, why can't we have power? And so that was this really sort of profound moment. But the one I'm thinking about was, was last year, and it was a group of black men um, in Cincinnati. And um, they were sort of, you know, um, very cynical, right? Like, it doesn't matter. We don't know who these people are. Lots of conspiracy theories, y'all. It, like, it was like having your uncles all in one room <laughs> with some Hennessy. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it was going back and forth and going back and forth. And finally, this one older man um, uh, said, um, he just sort of cut through the, you know, cut through and was essentially like, we have a choice to make, right? Um, so we can talk all of that, right? Or we can uh, move with belief and hope over here and then talk about how we move forward, right? So we sort of cut through. Um, and it was interesting because it was almost like, it was, remember maybe it was more like being in the barbershop, right? So you had, so this, this older black man sort of like shut the conversation down. Like we're not gonna go down this road of saying we can't, we can't, we can't. Um, and this one dude who had been the most kind of conspiratorial said, you know, I'm just going to be honest. Um, I am 
you know, I'm saying all these things because I don't actually know what you guys are talking about. Like, I don't understand all of this. Um, and I think that what happens, he said, you know, we just, we get defensive and we start saying it doesn't matter because we feel, this is my word, because we feel disempowered by the lack of information that we have. And so there's this thing that we do in our community where we say that people are apathetic or, you know, we don't know why they're doing these things. And part of it is because people do feel disempowered by not having information. And I don't just mean information about the candidates, right? Like who is this person and what is their platform? People feel disempowered by lack of information about the process. Right about what is about what 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 is this democracy experiment that we're engaged in, and actually what is my role supposed to be in it? Because I don't know, and I don't know what I don't know what you mean by midterm. What is a midterm? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what the um, what if we flip the house. I don't know what that's gonna do. I don't you know I don't know what that means. I don't know what power they have. I think someone should check Trump, but can they? Right? People, if we don't. People don't have this information, and so some of this is what we're trying. Again, this this thing for us about being able to have conversations because that is then the conversation that we need to have in our community. That is the thing we need to address. What kind of information are we giving to people? Right? It's not just handing them, you know, a, a doing a lit drop so people know what are the most important issues to a candidate. Right, it really is a process of us going through collectively understanding what it looks like and what it can look like when we embrace our full citizenship and use that full citizenship as a way to actually build our power. So speaking of um, lack of information and access to information, I'm wondering if um, any of you want to talk about um, some of the, there's different types of data, um, qualitative, quantitative, there's surveys, polls. I don't really know the difference between a survey and a poll. Um, I'm not sure I quite know what big data is, but can you talk about how do you give access to folks who are math folks like me to the information, um, to not be afraid of the numbers, um, to, and then, but also to kind of be more critical about um, data as the primary, source of information that's going to lead our organizing campaigns. Um, you know, what are some of the pitfalls of using data, 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 um, and how could it be manipulated? Because I, you know, I have a great suspicion of data when I see polls that say something crazy about black people. And it's like, you know, we, we're looking at the same numbers and you have a different interpretation or you ignored this part of the numbers or just talk a little bit about what are some of the, the challenges. Yeah, I can start. I think first and foremost, you know, there's been a lot of effort to obfuscate, to mystify, and to even make understanding around data. We call it algorithmic, algorithmic literacy and data literacy, like totally um, just not accessible to people whatsoever. And that's kind of where the power lies, right? People not understanding what data science is, how big data is collected, what an algorithm is. You know, an algorithm is really just a set of step-by-step -step in instructions to complete a task, right? Every time we're making a meal, or we're, that's an algorithm. A recipe is an algorithm, right? Then we have computational algorithms, which are like GPS, which are like FICO credit scores. Well, those are also proprietary algorithms owned by corporations. So there's a lot of effort to make this like so, um, not just uh, exclusive information and just intentionally obscure, but also um, to really, really, really weaponize that information in a way as well, right? And I think that is really the reality of so many of our, our communities, black communities experience with data. You know, you talked about being a historian when I started in this role as executive director and I saw how much um, traction we were getting with the work that we were doing. You know, instead of me going straight into R and doing all my data and data analysis work, I went and I studied history again, right? Because we see the ways in which historically um, these visions, these values, these narratives, um, these policies are embedded into current data systems and data processes, right? You know, I always, um, when I go talk, I always talk about, for example, how zip code has become a proxy for race, right? And when you think, right, you know, you know, but it's amazing how many researchers and data scientists, even people who work in tech companies, when I say this, they're like, oh, how? And I said, well, if you look at the history of redlining, right, and you look at the ways in which 
you know, th 1933 homeowners loan corporation maps, some neighborhoods were designated as being hazardous, some were being designated as being de desirable. When you look at maps now and see where the greatest disparities are, it's literally identical to those homeowners loan corporation maps. And this was a part of the New Deal. So when we talk about the New Deal, we have to be real about who the New Deal was for, right? It was at the expense of black communities. Zip codes come around and zip code is a way for the Postal Service to organize the country, you know, but that, all that history around restrictive contracts, redlining, who can buy homes where, who can't live there, that's embedded in this zip code, these digits that are then used um, to not only create new mathematical models, but to do research, to make decisions. And I think one of the biggest areas we see that, for example, is in car insurance algorithms. There's been a lot of research that shows that if you live in a zip code, I mean, we can use Chicago as an example, you know, in, um, in the loop, you know, you're paying less car insurance than, than someone who lives in a working class community on the south side, even though there was more crime and foot traffic and all that stuff going on in uh, downtown than it is on the south side. But according to Geico, farmers, all these different um, insurance algorithms, it's based on zip code, right? And because of the racialized organization geographically of our country, right? All that is embedded and zip code becomes a proxy for race. I mean, growing up in Miami, I always knew that if you put somebody's zip code on Sunny Isles Beach, you were gonna get lower insurance premium. But that has real impact for folks in our communities. Same for FICO credit scores, especially in, in finances too. So I think, you know, understanding that history, understanding the reality of that, but then also realizing that a lot of our folks are scientists. A lot of our folks are data scientists. We just don't use that language, right? Me being an organizer, I realized that the data science process, the actual process of going from an observation to developing a method and then coming up, you know, doing the experimentation and disseminating findings is not that similar than the process that we use on the community level to assess the needs, create a campaign, develop strategy, and bring that loop back to actual social change, right? We're doing a lot of work too with folks in the indigenous community who are talking about data sovereignty, right? Like, none of these things are new to our communities, but there's been an effort to rebrand them and to make them corporate and, and to, again, concentrate the power of this, of this information into the hands of a few. And that's why one of the kind of narrative campaigns I've been doing now is to abolish big data, right? How do we abolish the structures that put data into the hands of a few? And how do we give access to data to people who need it the most, who will use it the most, right? Folks in our communities on the ground. And, you know, I think, um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your total question, but, you know, I think how do we, how do we break down those silos, right? And, and for us, and Data for Black Lives, it's what does it look like to put people in the same room? What does it look like to have on a panel called, we are, you know, where are the black scientists? Yes, having mathematicians, black PhDs talking about their experience in, in, in the academy, but also having, you know, a mom there of eight children who's been working, you know, for the last 20 years to get schools funded in New York City, who does not have any scientific expertise, but can speak around the disparities in science education and can speak to the data more powerfully than anybody else in the room, right? And I think for us, it goes to how do we build up algorithmic literacy? How do we you know, actually get information? How do we train people up, right? How do we provide workshops and data visualization? How do we you know, educate people that not only are you interacting with an algorithm, but that algorithm has inherent bias and this is how it's impacting your lives, but also, you know, how do we really um, have people understand that we can also use these tools, we can reclaim these tools, right? Our, our slogan is, we, we believe that data is protest, data is accountability, and data is collective action, right? Like, you know, I know there was a lot of conversation yesterday, there was a lot of conversation just nationally and just all across the board around the role that tech plays, around who owns tech, who controls tech, but for us, again, coming from my personal experience of being a high school student using data, but also being able to interact with people every day um, through our movement, through this work that are, again, they may not be realizing that they're using data in this way. They, they may not have the language, but they're doing it. Um, yeah. To the, there's so many pitfalls. I mean, I, you know, as black people, as people committed to social justice, we should be skeptical of everything, including data, yeah. Um, part of it has to do with 
who is producing the data, right? Uh, we don't think just because they're black, that means that they're producing data that will empower black people. So what are their political commitments? What are their relationships with organizers and activists? Um, there is, as you said, a range of kind of methods for data from qualitative to quantitative that includes survey and polling. I think we, you know, there will be experts who can help us think about the quality of the data that's being produced and how it's being utilized. I, I guess the thing I would say, and you said something about why should data be at the center of our organizing. I don't think it should be at the center, right? Like to me, the most important thing we need to do is to organize, to base build, to bring people both into an electoral process, but also understand that that is not the end goal, right? That we're, you know, everything that was said yesterday, we're trying to kind of transform how people understand what is possible and elections are part of it. Elections are a moment when people are paying attention and when we should be paying attention to what people want. But data is a tool. And I think quite often, and I'll say this to every organizer in the room, I want you all to organize us, right? I want you to say, Kathy, this is the data that you have. This is how we want to use it, right? I mean, this, this is what we were built to do and what I think we all want to do, right? We, I don't pretend to be an organizer. I pretend to be an act, I'm not pretend. I am <laughs> an activist and have com political commitments to the liberation of black people. And if data will help us move in that direction, let's do this, right? Um, there, you know, there are all kinds of tensions, not only about the quality, but what role should data play if we're thinking about the infrastructure that's needed over the long haul, right, to mobilize black people. And I think this is tension, right? So should foundations be funding us to create data? If we're not already like in partnership with people who are doing organizing, like I think we have to think about, right, capacity, infrastructure. What does an organizing uh, landscape look like that includes data but doesn't necessarily center data, right? And I'll say one more thing really quickly about focus groups, which I love. We did focus groups right after Obama was elected. And I will say that young people, again, have often the deepest insights. And we asked the question about how important was it to have President Obama elected. And repeatedly what we heard young people say is, symbolically, and they use the word symbolic, it's great, but it's gonna have no impact on whether the police pull me over, on the quality of my school, right? They were able to differentiate between what it means to have the visibility or the, you know, somebody uh, black who was going to head a kind of neoliberal governance structure and real change in their communities. And I'm not drawing those uh, distinctions maybe as clearly as it sounds, but I do think if we are able to listen to young folks, and I mean all, maybe all black people, in a way that is respectful and understands that lived experience brings expertise and insight and, and use multiple mechanisms to do that, to inform how we're thinking about organizing, I think that becomes critical. And I'll say one last thing, which is even if we think about the election, right? The narrative has been that black people love Biden or at least support Biden because of his connection to Obama. Uh, but the truth is, at least in our data, there's a huge generational divide with young black people really, if you take in the margin of error, splitting their allegiance between Biden and Sanders. And if we ask about specific things like who would be better on climate uh, issues, it's usually Sanders, except for, again, maybe a two-point difference between young black people and, and other groups that we survey. So I think we can tell, again, a more complicated narrative and story about black people's support and th thoughts about this election. The truth is more young black people say, I don't know if I'm gonna vote at all than say I support any specific candidate, right? What we need to be paying attention to is the level of alienation where majorities of all young people say, I hate the two party system, right? There are insights and inroads there that if we let the kind of 
traditional political parties or the traditional press frame our understanding of this election, we will go down the wrong road again. All right. I mean, so, so I, I, yes, and I think that not only it will also cause us to be have to have the wrong conversations in our community. Right. I mean, I think about the um, Jim's question yesterday about what would you say mm -hmm. uh, to a church lady um, about um, about right. you know maybe not Biden. Right. Um, it's not the question, but anyway, that is. <laughs> um, and I and my and I thought well it's interesting because I think so just two things one is part of what we have to understand is why right um, not the like uh, the uh, our uh, our ability to convince folks particularly in this moment where people feel like they're in crisis has to begin with understanding why people are leaning the way they are leaning and I think that that's and it's not and it's not and, and in the reality when we look at all the data is that it isn't just the church lady right it is. It is across the board in many ways, and so there is this. There's a question that we have to ask ourselves about who, what are we, how are we having these conversations, and what is the conversation that we think that we're having mm -hmm. about where people split their support in this particular in this particular election? Because it's important that we we start where people are and not where we want them to be, right? Um, that and we, that's basic. That's organizing 101, right? Um, that we have to we have to meet our people where they are, and we also have to think about them not just in terms of older people and younger people, right? There are real distinctions between Gen Z and millennials, and we should not conflate the two, and we should not suggest that someone who's 32 has this is thinking the same way, has the same analysis, has the same political uh, experience as someone who is 19. They are different. And we have to understand those differences because we're having because we have to have very different kinds of conversations that eventually get us to here, right? Collectively, but we are have we have we have to have different um, we have to have those conversations differently. We also have to think about the distinctions between older women, women my generation, right? Gen X women. Um, the the distinctions between Black women, the distinctions between Black men. We have to think about the distinctions between. Um, immigrant black immigrant communities um and native born black communities these are real things right and so to, to kathy's point earlier about when we say we or what the, our, people, our people our people are many right and the data has to help us understand what those distinctions are not just because it's important for us to know in general right like people are the, the different constituencies within the black electorate have different needs and so we need to understand that um but also because there's there are vast political differences, right? Um, and so not not vast. I shouldn't say that they're not vast, but there are political differences. Um, there are differences in uh, all of those the uh, all of those um, uh, uh, different constituencies that I just named about how people think um, the economy is going, right? Younger black people think the economy is not that bad, right? I mean, they think it's bad, but they think it's less bad than their uh, than, than older folks, right? Um, there's a difference in how people, what people think about Trump, right? And the differences aren't stark, right? It's not like 90% of one group loves him and 20% doesn't, but they are differences, and we have to understand what that is. Um, so I think it's the, the and when we think about again the the we the, we are not a monolith is a term that we often use but I think that we we don't totally think about what the different fault lines are um, and what we have to do to to bridge those things and to come to some common understanding and analysis um, of uh, you know of of our our people for real. Okay, I was going to ask you about the black census, but go ahead. Oh, okay. I, I was just going to say the other thing is. There are fewer differences, and all the differences you said are absolutely right. There are fewer differences if we're only thinking about, and I know you're not, politics as the electoral arena. And there are more differences when we think about what is a kind of idea about a new vision of the economy that provide good jobs and good living and joy for people, right? When we think about how do we change mass incarceration and criminal justice, when we think about the agenda that we're trying to move people towards through the election, but beyond the election, that's when there are even more differences that we have to engage and be thinking about how we're moving people and who we're moving. Because I'm not assuming I'm moving all black people. I'm assuming I'm trying to move some black, most black people to, to a place of liberation. 
Yeah, I wanted to add something about um, election. We're obviously a 501c3, so I really can't speak to a lot around that. But you know, speaking of like alienation and all that, like of, of, of young people around the 2016 election, I actually started to identify more as an anarchist because I was so kind of frustrated with what was happening. And at that time too, I was working at Color of Change and I was working on Organized for, but my job was um, also on voting rights. I you know, come again from a tradition of direct action organizing where we see voting as a tactic, we see organizing and movement building as real vehicles for change. But it was not until I started to work within color change and tracking voter suppression efforts all over the country that I really started to realize that while I might not be thinking about voting rights and voter suppression and the election, there are definitely people, right-wing folks, who are extremely invested in making sure that black folks just never make it to the polls, right? And I think there's a data piece of that too, right? So first thing, you know, it, I'm so grateful for that experience, even though it was really difficult, and I commend anybody who's actually on the ground working in campaigns right now, because I know it must be tough, but when, when, when we were doing the work on voter suppression, that's around the time when I started to learn about Cambridge Analytica, even before a lot of the um, news came out and it kind of went viral and Christopher Wiley's on TV talking about it. But, you know, this is like, I think, a very important thing to talk about and to uplift, and it's part of the reason why Data for Black Lives when the Zuckerberg hearing started happening and folks in Congress um, started to ask Mark Zuckerberg around Cambridge Analytica, ask him about their data sharing practices and how, you know, the, the, the data of over 2.1 billion users be used to manipulate the election and other elections all over the world. Um, one of the things that we noticed immediately was that there was such a lack of, again, algorithmic literacy, even in the halls of power, even in folks in Congress, right? So I wrote an open letter to, to Facebook on behalf of the Data for Black Lives movement where we pretty much laid out three demands, right? The first was for uh, Facebook to commit data to a public data trust. The second was to develop a code of ethics. And the third was to hire more black data scientists and researchers to work within Facebook. Again, not all black data scientists, we just people with a certain consciousness, political understanding, um, and hopefully people who are exposed also to the social justice and, and organizing movement. So, but you know, the first demand around a public data trust, I knew that, uh, you know, I didn't do any of this to fight with Mark Zuckerberg, there, you know, to, to, to fight, I, I don't have time for that. But, and obviously there's a lot of organizations, color of change, a lot of folks who are really, really, really doing an amazing job of, of holding these folks accountable. But for me, it was like, how do we shift the narrative, right? How do we have a different conversation around the standards that we hold big tech companies to? How do we, when this happens again, which it will because Facebook has been able to calcify and consolidate a lot of political power, how do we make sure that we're asking different questions and putting out different demands? And we make it, and when we make a demand that, that Facebook commits data to a public data trust, that's knowing that their bread and butter is their data, is our data, right? And that that goes against all their profit motives. But the second one around developing a code of ethics really comes from the fact that when all this was happening, Christopher Wiley, who's a researcher at Cambridge Analytica, exposed the fact that they were actually using personality tests, survey tools via Facebook through an app to get personality profiles and to then target advertisements, target content, to then sway people's uh, political decisions and how they're actually showing up at the polls. You know, that to me reminded me of a long history of um, human subjects research without people's consent, right? For us, it was very reminiscent of Tuskegee Airmen, Henry and Lacks, people using research, weaponizing research, deceptively and invasively in order to fulfill a political goal, right? So while Facebook, which is which creates you know peer-reviewed articles, they're pushing out research, you go on research.facebook.com, you'll see all the information and how they've been able to aggregate that and actually create like real peer-reviewed articles. Unlike most research institutions, they don't have to go through an institutional review board process. There's no way for us to hold them accountable in that respect, right? So what does that mean for voter suppression? What does that mean for voter rights, right? Now we're hearing about, you know, Facebook uh, contracting Israeli firms in order to target, you know, and fight back different organizations like Color of Change to really, really continue to not just, you know, I would like to say criminalize black political participation, but to really suppress it in a significant way. So the result of that Facebook letter has been a lot of work 
you know, again, my focus isn't necessarily on fighting Facebook. It's about building power in our communities, but it's been incredible to see the ways in which we've been able to, again, educate not just our communities, our network, but people in Congress about the ways in which we're gonna continue to see these things come up. And I think the second thing, you know, voter, in terms of voter suppression, um, um, that's happening, that is going to happen, that is not necessarily happening on election day, that we take very seriously and, and, and we've been really strategizing around is the upcoming 2020 census, right? There's been only 22 censuses in this country's history. It happens every 10 years. This is the very first census that's gonna happen online. The census not only decides how many electors each state has, it decides districts, right? It also makes big decisions around where $880 billion of funding is gonna be allocated. So this is a really big deal, and especially since it's happening in a political climate of extreme fear and paranoia with the effort of getting folks to honestly not do the census and to not be counted, right? So I think that's another thing I wanted to put on people's radars because thinking about the election, but also beyond, right? You know. Many of our folks in our communities can't vote because of felony disenfranchisement, but everybody can fill out the census, right? How do we as community organizations tell people right now they're doing a census test where they've included the citizenship question, even though three judges blocked it, but how do we let people know in case that this does come up, you don't have to fill that out. Maybe not explicitly saying that because it is illegal, but saying do your best to fill it out, right? How do we you know, support grassroots efforts. I know Urban League and other groups are also mobilizing to get folks to actually fill it out. Um, and also thinking about beyond that, what are the privacy concerns? Thank you. Um, I think we're gonna open it up. We have about a half hour left. And um, is there a mic for the audience or do I run around? There's a mic over here, me works. I see you. <laughs> Can you project? Oh, I think so. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. All the way in the back. Excuse me. Since you're talking about text, and I know there's a law in the European Union where if you want your information that the companies have collected, you have a right to it. And if you don't get it, you can. Um, they can be penalized. And particularly in Ireland, I know they're doing a lot of work. Is that something you guys are looking at? I know um, that the tech companies are looking at how do we keep Congress from passing legislation that is equal to what's happened in the European Union. So people can just call and say, give me all your information. So anybody wanna to speak to that? Yeah, I can speak briefly. What you're talking about is the GDPR protections. And yeah, folks in Congress, and of course local organizations, national groups have been fighting for similar legislation here. I think we've been able to see more traction locally, right? In, in, in many law enforcement agencies, they're not allowed to go on Facebook anymore and arrest people and catfish people. Like, you know, all that stuff that they, all these police tactics that they've been doing, right? And I think one of the things that actually came out of our Facebook letter and our work was um, Cory Booker's office uh, sponsored with Yvette Clark a um, Algorithmic Accountability Act, right? Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the privacy protections, but we're going a step further and talking about how do we audit these automated processes? How do we address bias? And how do we actually not use data to like, reinforce this incredible inequality in this country. I have another question. Thank you for um, enlightening me. I also am a data phobe, uh, Tracy, so this is helpful. I think I have a better relationship with data now. But um, I'm wondering, something that was underlying in a couple comments was this, um, the, con somebody said conspiratorial. Um, perspective that black people often have about people asking them questions, doing something to them with you know, information that they give. And I'm wondering if there are generational differences showing up in that type of skepticism about, because I worry, frankly, that on the input side, that is the you know, going to people and making sure that they are generating the, the information and it's authentically from them, that if there's a reluctance to do that because, oh, here you go again, what are you gonna do with this? Who are you? I don't care if you're, you know, with Gen 4, I don't, I don't trust this. But I wonder if because of how um, social media savvy and, and attuned young people are, if maybe that's less of a concern. I don't, I don't know if I'm asking the question clearly, yeah. but. I 
worry about it. So, so I, I do think that there is, in general, and I think, again, it's probably a very good thing that black people in general are more skeptical. Now, having said that, uh, the way surveys work, right, which is if there's a total of 3,000 respondents, you're looking at your response rate to see if there's a significant difference in the number of people across any group who say, no, I'm not going to participate in that. If there is, then you have a problem. What we have found is that the skepticism is also balanced by the fact that in particular for young black people, but young people in general, they are so likely actually not to be asked what they think about important issues yeah. that they are very excited to participate and believe that someone actually values what they say. The other thing is, and this is more than you want to know, though, you know, once you have your respondents, then you're weighting them so that they are representative, right? So you're trying to deal with the bias that might undoubtedly creep into um, your sample. So I, I think your concern is right. I think it's important also, you know, to think about how what the methodologies are for dealing with those biases. I think a, a survey that has 150 black people is more susceptible to those types of biases and concerns than some of a, you know something at the other end that has 3,000 or 5,000, right? So those, these are all the things we want to think about in terms of the quality of the data that's being produced uh, in the name or, or representing black people, but you might be. And the only other thing I would add is that I think there is something different. So to, that, to the point about people never get asked and so they are excited and want to give their opinion. People are also excited that who is calling to ask their opinion or who is uh, doing the the, call or the, the online um, uh, you know poll is not an, a, not a candidate, mm -hmm. right? Like people are, the, the fact that someone independent from this sort of, you know, the you know the personalities of candidates or the or the uh, challenges of parties that it is someone independent asking their opinion also um, leads people to say that they that they that they're willing to participate because they do want it. They want people want to be heard um, and and want to be heard in different ways. Hi, good afternoon or good morning. Thank you. Uh, so on that note, I am uh, someone who years ago switched my uh, party registration from Democrat to Independent mm -hmm. because surveys surveyed independents, and so I said, I'll, I want to be surveyed yeah. and uh, <laughs> get in there. Um, so I'm uh, and, and skeptical of the two-party system, um, and even with the, the narrative shift in the Democratic Party today, I'm not quite convinced, mm -hmm. and so I'm curious. Uh, from everyone, uh, but I'm thinking about Black Pack and Kathy, um, just about conversations around third party and what that looks like. And just really quick and then pass it on. I mean, our data of young people, 18 to 36, what we find is anywhere from 62 to about 75% say they would support a third party. Right, but that is not just young people. There's a deep alienation in the dysfunction of what people understand to be the state, right? The Congress, uh, Trump, all of that. Now here's the thing, I always say to people, the reason right now that there is no third party, or, I'm sorry, Mo, uh, there is a third party. <laughs> uh, major, major, but my people, my pe I can't even say major. Anyway, the reason there doesn't seem to be a consolidated quote unquote third party is that all those people who want a third party work, want different things, right? And so we, that might make us think differently about just saying we want a third party. And I said this to someone else, I'm not sure a third party is the most radical alternative to rethinking governance, right? Because it still stays with really a traditional party system. And so someone, you know, yesterday mentioned kind of uh, priority, you know, they're all different ways of structuring voting that as the left and the black left, we might want to be engaging and not just thinking about a third party. But the numbers suggest people know this doesn't work for them. Right. So what are we offering them instead? So I think there's, I mean, I would just say two things. I'm sorry, I'm trying to pull up numbers that I can't find. So let me um, mm -hmm. let me just try and do it without it. Um, 
So there's, there is, I mean, we saw 2016 was an example, right, of the degree to which younger people in particular are willing to vote third party, right? Like the margin of difference um, in that election was uh, third party voters. Um, so, so that's one. And so that's a, that is, that is, um, that is a, that is an important, I, we can't um, underemphasize yeah. that point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because it because it changed an election, right? Um, we can't overemphasize. Over sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the other thing I would say is that and so third party is one thing, but I think to your point that you have uh, a lot of uh, younger people in particular, but again, not just young people um, who are no longer identifying as Democrats, right? And so you have both, and so it's certainly younger people, and if they and if they do identify as as Democrat, it is a weak Democrat, uh, or it is a independent who leans Democrat, right? And that's certainly among young people, but we've also seen that in the last couple of years, including in 2016 with black women, identifying less with the Democratic Party. Um, and so if you, so that's a, you know, it, it, again, that means many things. Um, for us, it, it is, it means that we're having a different conversation with, with, with black people. We're not, we're having a very different conversation about, because we can't just show up and say, um, you know, or, or people often just want to put put on mail like the person's name and a D, right? Nobody cares about that, yeah. right? That's that's no that is not that's not a way to motivate black folks to turn out and vote any longer. Is to simply say that this person is a Democrat because that's not people want to know like, what are you going to do, right? What are you going to do for me? What do you believe in? And does that align with what I, with I, what I feel like my and my community and my family's needs are? Um, and where I think uh, the country needs to go. So there has been this shift um, that's very real about whether or not the degree to which our community identifies with Democrats. The challenge is that, I, and so I think there's the third party piece, but I think that the, the reality, there is a reality, third party is never gonna be Republicans, right? Like that doesn't actually happen. Um, but it does mean that it, there is an opportunity to have a different kind of conversation with, within our community about what party actually means. Right, and what we what we expect from a party, um, and opens up, I think, a conversation that we haven't had. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hold on, honey. yes, just gonna talk. I just want to throw in the same point, which is the what we're finding is the bigger mobilizer is not your party ID, but your party opposition. That increasingly people so hate the other party mm -hmm. that that gets them to the polls, mm -hmm. or they have a higher unfavorability of the other party than they have favorability of their party. Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, am, I, am I up now? Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I want to uh, speak on behalf of the uncles <laughs> who were disparaged earlier in the conversation. Uh, and I might add some aunties as well. Uh, <laughs> But, but one of the things that fuels the skepticism and cynicism uh, that the uncles have about data <laughs> is that data is filtered through the lens of ideology. Yeah. And we all see examples where if a prevailing ideology can reject data. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen the two decades of Republican administrations uh, yeah. denying this climate change, yeah. right? And so that, so the power, if the power of data can be diminished by ideology, uh, how do you get people to believe that data can potentially push through a prevailing ideology and create change? So what's, uh, to, to tell the uncles why we should believe uh, that data can make a difference. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that being agreed by silence? No, no, yeah. no, that's a good question. You know, and I think, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good question. I think, you know, a lot of, definitely a lot of data is absolutely informed by ideology. I think a lot of the existing prevailing data that we have, you know, is certainly the result of past political decisions, past narratives. Um, and I think that at the same time, there is a role for different kinds of data from different perspectives in order to counter that, right? When I say that we want to make data a tool for social change instead of a weapon of political oppression, like that's fundamentally a cultural change, right? Much of what we know about data, people learn from like what, Hollywood? Like 
you know, and, and science in general, right? Like, you know, Mr. Robot, or like, I don't know what's the TV shows now that are data related, but again, I think that's in an effort to get people to be ignorant around the ways in which data is actually impacting their everyday lives. And I think, you know, I don't have a necessarily, I, my, my response to that question is honestly like, don't, I don't know. But I can say what's been working for me, and I think through Data for Black Lives, it's whether it's through our conference space, whether it's through me telling my own story, uplifting the voices of people who are using data differently, right? Who have used, who are using data as a tactic in, a, in the hands of people who are already organizing, who are already pushing for change in their communities, right? And I think, you know, one of the things that I always talk about when I go around and speak, I talk about, for example, the, like the crack baby myth, right? That was based on a study with 23 participants. Gen Ford has a sample size of 3,000. But 23 participants, right? It took that, just, just that, in order to create this entire ideological regime around black children, black youth, black families, the welfare state, you know, public benefits. And it wasn't until 2013 that New, the New York Times did a follow-up on one of the participants and you know, she was the first in her family to graduate from college and to actually like, you know, kind of achieve this, uh, I guess the level of success that in America that we deem as being acceptable. But, you know, what they realized was the real indicator of, you know, young people um, becoming, you know, the, the, this burden to society as John DeLulio, a social scientist, had, had said through the crack baby myth and the super predator myth and um, the doctor who actually founded this study said, the real thing was poverty, right? But it's, even after all that happened, right, we're still dealing with that narrative. So I think that's why it's important for, that we have Gen Ford. It's why that's important that, again, we are in control of these data collection tools and we are in control of the methods and the means by which we're disseminating information, we're collecting it. And one of the things that we're doing at Data for Black Lives is raising a multi-million dollar research fund. Because we have folks in our network who are even getting PhDs in places like Harvard, but they would never be allowed to research black stuff. You know, seriously, we're talking about Jeffrey Epstein. This guy identified as being a science philanthropist. He's funded so much work around artificial intelligence, around data. These are the people who are making decisions around these narratives and these ideologies, and we have to challenge that. I keep saying one more thing, which is, hey, uncle, I'm right here. Uh, I, I think the other thing that we're trying to do, though, is, and I think we all would, I think we all would agree with this, is, and I think maybe it was, I don't know, Tim Jiwe or Rachel yesterday talked about moving hearts and minds, right? And just a data point or seven data points don't do that. But if, in fact, someone that you respect, that you love, that you identify with, then pens an op-ed that says, this is my experience, and hey, here's this data. So for example, we have a, not we, well, there's a piece coming out in the Washington Post tomorrow with, from Mike Brown's mother, talking about five years later and how the experiences of young black people haven't changed, but also a vision of what criminal justice reform might look like that cites Gen Forward data. The important thing there is not Gen Forward data, it's her voice, but her voice opens up a space where people can also then see that data that says, huh, young people are having these experiences and envision a new world around what criminal justice or safety and protection looks like for black people. To me, that's what we're doing, right? Data in and of itself is fine, but who's the vehicle that can say, listen for a minute, I got something to tell you, and this data helps me tell that story. That's what I think we're doing. And I guess I would just add that the, I think part of the skepticism, though, is um, justified, right? Like I think when we, okay. you know, I, I was thinking of, you try, I was trying to, when you asked the question, I was trying to think of what are examples, and it, and it was hard because, um, you know, we, we did a focus group uh, last year on a ballot initiative um, in Ohio with our partner in Ohio that was, uh, the ballot initiative was on um, uh, reducing mass incarceration and there were like three or four uh, ways in which this ballot initiative was going to reduce uh, incarceration rates. 
Um, and when we talked to the folks in the room about it, they just simply didn't believe it, right? They didn't, they didn't believe, because they, they didn't believe that we were, that any of the things that were in this validation were actually gonna have an impact because they have no experience of those things having an impact, right? And so that's part, so the, a lot of the skepticism is, um, is justified. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, I think that we, we often don't have the forums to actually present this information to people uh, for, uh, from us, about us, right? Food, food maybe. Um, <laughs> then, so we don't actually have the forums and that's why I feel like the focus groups end up being so rich is because not only are we asking them information, but we're saying, hey, look at these three charts, right? And what do you think about that? And people are often like, I had no idea. Oh, that's all we have to do? That's all we need right. to be able to right. move X? Right. Oh, we can do that. Like, there's this really interesting moment with young people, actually, in a focus group where it became this competition. They were like, oh, white kids are doing that? We can do that, right? right. Um, so there is, we don't often have the forums to do it. And so maybe that's, that's certainly on us, right, to try and present, to try and figure out ways in which we're getting information out, not just to our to partners, which we also struggle to do, um, but to actually get it out to our people so that they can see what the possibility is um, for you know both our for building power, but also for making um, transformative change. And what are some of the ways in which you get the the data that you collect to organizers? Can anybody give specific examples, or are there any organizers in the room who'd like to speak on their own use of data or the data they need? What can I get? So I was going to say, or how you would like. Yes. Us to get you this information. Right. Uh, <laughs> is there a mic? Oh, yeah, but it was somebody. Oh, somebody else. And then, yeah. I'll, I'll, try to, I'll go very quick. Hi, I'm, I'm Ted. Uh, I work with Working Families Party and also a group called the Grassroots Policy Project. I want to thank everyone. This has been an extraordinarily enlightening uh, panel. I've learned a ton. Um, my question is kind of, it's actually very much to the point that was just raised. Um, and sort of an ethical and political question for folks. So anyone who's ever worked on elections knows that um, there's always vastly more people that you could talk to than you can afford to talk to, and you have to make decisions about who you're gonna talk to. Um, and we often rely on voter data, um, some of which is collected from uh, probably very ethically questionable sources. Um, but I can tell you with intimate experience, it, it works. It, it, it does allow you to tell you this person is more likely to be responsive to your message than this other person. Yeah. Um, and uh, given some of the things that are being said about uh, you know, different groups of people who might be more open to certain kind of radical messages, certain messages about third parties, certain messages about socialism, you name it, I'm wondering what you all think about um, that practice of drawing up your voter universes um, and how that could be something uh, that we can lean into uh, and do well versus something that we could do really poorly. Thinking specifically, we have elections coming up this fall in Philadelphia where we're running two candidates on a Working Families Party ticket um, and we need a lot of votes and it's a big city and we have to, I think, Delvon and I were talking about this last night, we're gonna have to be very intelligent about who we decide to invest resources in going to try to talk to. So just wondering what you all think about that. And can we go ahead and just get Charlene, your, your comment? And then, uh, so admittedly, Kathy has been trying to get BYP 100 to use Thank you. Black Youth Project data for years, and we, I don't think we ever found the right way to do it. And I'm not exactly sure why. I think capacity has a lot to do with it. And yeah, and like the breadth of the organization, like mm -hmm. it's really, it's, it's, it's across the country and people have different needs mm -hmm. and understandings. And I think some of the opportunities uh, most naturally would fit, I think, with the public policy folk. Um, but even with that, so that's something to talk to the new co-directors or the current co-directors <laughs> about. And the new policy, there's a new policy person on staff now. Yeah. Uh, so I, perhaps, you know, there may be a space. Uh, I remember one piece of data that we ran with, uh, and that was the fifth black people in Chicago were 15 times more likely to be arrested, ticketed, yeah. Uh, or fines for uh, minor marijuana possession in Chicago. That was the basis, along with stories, of an entire campaign to decriminalize marijuana or cannabis in the state of Illinois and specifically in Chicago. And so that was something that was brought, that was exposed to us through journalism. And there's an article in the Chicago Reader 
Uh, and somebody, I think it may have been Jason who got his hands on that article. Actually, you can correct me if I'm wrong. And we, yeah, we took that data and just ran with it. And it allowed us to build out a whole campaign uh, that I strongly believe contributed to the full decriminalization and legalization of cannabis in the state of Illinois. So, yep. And that was just one data point. So I think you've raised a very important question, which is one, there's lots of, often lots of money around elections, but those are generally controlled by the two parties and the big national orgs. Um, two, I worry, and we validate our data, meaning we can tell you we use Catalyst and L2 and we can tell you who voted in the past and who didn't, and then we can do an analysis to see if those who voted look different than those who didn't. But if people don't have a big sample and they, as you say, lean into the voting, then you reproduce that same group and you don't do any base building. And that's right. my concern about the kind of almost exclusive use of voter validated data. And what we mean by that are people, data from individuals who have voted in the past because you're trying to craft a message and you think in fact that they're more likely to vote. If we have a commitment to, to base build, which I think in fact that's how we use elections, then we can't only use catalyst data, right? right? Then we've got to have bigger samples. And the good news for us with Gen Ford is we have a bigger sample. About half our sample are voters and half aren't. But I, I think that's that's the right question to ask. And then to this really quick question that Charlene was talking about, which is with Gen Ford, it's largely national data, meaning we draw a sample from across the country. And increasingly, if you're doing a campaign, you're doing a campaign in a specific site. If you're looking, thinking about local elections, it's in a specific site. So we have to think about, and again, if we were able to have an infrastructure that allowed us consistently to work with activists and organizers, you could say to us, we got two elections coming up in Philly. Can you do an oversample of Philly, which we could, for one or two surveys and get you some data that you want? Now, let me, the last thing I'll say is, of course, live stream, we're offering this to anyone across the ideological perspective. Um, but if you're in the room and you want to talk to me, we can make it happen. <laughs> a question specifically about Jim Forward. How many people and how much money does it cost? To run a project at that scale, it costs a about lot about of money. How much? Yeah, I mean, I I'm out here it. hustling all the time. But I mean, and this is this is the issue, right? I mean, I'm, real, I'm really serious about this. Like, we are getting money from MacArthur, Open Society, and Ford, right? That's those are our primary funders right now. When I take money, that means look, they got a lot of money, so I don't, you know. But does it mean that they're not giving money to? M for BL or BYP 100 or Dream Defenders, I would say no. But I think in their heads, they're saying, well, how does this advance a certain type of agenda? They don't, I don't think, and, and let me just say, my program officers are fantastic. They get it, but most funders don't understand why they should be funding polls and the creation of data. Like, because they would say, no, 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 people are in the streets right now, that's what we're gonna fund. And that's what I mean about understanding the landscape and infrastructure needed for mass mobilization. I'm trying to get an M4BL's data table also. You got me? Okay, okay. Yeah. Hi, um, I had a, another question and comment. <clears throat> and I think Hyams could probably help on this. So, I think something the foundation sector is faced with, I mean the good people in the foundation sector, Hyams included, um, is what are we funding? How are we funding it? What is the impact? Uh, are people duplicating? Are they reinventing? Are they coalescing? Are they unified? <clears throat> I went through a very long process with the Ford Foundation who basically said, we are gonna stop funding um, pro-choice this and pro-choice that until you all get yourself together and uh, come up with a united strategy. And then we'll, we'll sit down and talk. Or if you need us to help facilitate that conversation, we're happy to do that. But at the end of the day, if you are not unified and you can't measure your success, 
with our investment in terms of the ROI, it's not good for you and it's not good for us. It's, it's less good. We're concerned about impact and we want to fund you, but can we facilitate a united front here? Particu and this happens particularly around election time, which I think is a huge problem as well because we have to be doing this all year, every year, 24 seven. It's not rising and falling around an election even though elections are critical. Um, so I just wanted to get your insight also from Hyams. Um, what is the potential, particularly in this, you know, particularly in, in this ravaging time that we're faced um, with, um, about efforts to really unify um, our efforts, manage and facilitate the funding mechanisms, and also count our, our results? Thank you. Right. So you, uh, yeah. I'll start with Hyams, mm -hmm. and I am, you know, I, I am a huge data geek too. I really love research, and I love, and I don't, con I don't disconnect community organizing and data because it's just the information. I mean, you don't do anything without information. There's some information you're going to use, and I really wish data had a better reputation. But I, for all the reasons you heard on the panel, it does. <laughs> You know? rebranding. Rebranding. Right, rebranding. <laughs> so I think the thing is the challenge in philanthropy, and that's that's an issue of her. I worked at National Philanthropy, you know, worked at Open Society and Kellogg. And the question is, sort of like, what are you researchers who are under resourced for the most part? Because it's like these bigger philanthropy, they do give money for research. It's not like they don't. They give it all over the place to establish researchers. But then when it comes to the question of the voices that haven't been heard. The burden of proof then lies on those people who are coming to do research, like you prove to me that this is important, you prove to me, and it's a false choice that you know we're gonna fund you instead of organizing, which of course they absolutely do not have to do. I just want to be very clear, philanthropy tries to make that a split the baby conversation. It is not a split the baby conversation. It, both things can be funded, and both things need to be facilitated, as you said, together. So one of the things we do at HIAMS is we've commissioned a couple of very small uh, research projects. We, we just uh, are now beginning to work on an oversample in Boston in communities of color, surrounding communities of color, to look at climate resiliency and climate change and what do people of color think about it because, of course, there's this myth that people of color don't care about it, you know about climate change, and of course they do, very much so. And so we're, so we're asking those questions, but like one, it, it means building, it means going more in depth, it means a lot of money that is not unusual for philanthropy. Philanthropy spends big dollars on money, on, on research. They don't spend big money on connecting it then to, to organizers. So one of the things that we do at HIAMS, and it's very, it's a new muscle to build, is we also have a research advisory group. So what we do is we pull together people we want to use the research, as well as people who are doing, you know, a focus group here or there. They're doing, they're organizing, but they're trying to find out as well as they can. We're trying to connect the research that we're connected to. So the research that mass polling, you get a ton of money to do the horse race data all the time. UMass Boston, which you know does do some work. We'd love to connect with the other so many research institutions in the Boston area, but this is that is an actual process that philanthropy doesn't typically engage in. So we just sort of stand back and say, when you guys get together, you know, we're, we're here. You know, ask us. So anyway, that is that's a that's a great question. I would love for my colleagues. I'd love for us to have this conversation with Ford, MacArthur, Kellogg all the people, RWJ, you know, to talk about how do we actually, you know, coordinate all of our research concerns and questions, and how do we resource that appropriately so that we really are making the difference we want to make, and that you're not using type data that is like only slightly useful to you, but that really actually moves the agenda of people of color, marginalized people of color. So that's a short answer, but I don't know about it. Thank you, Jocelyn. And we're out of time. Um, I don't know if any of you want to say a quick one minute closing comment. Of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, that, because it's all about 
data. I'm going to just read. Uh, we asked this question about what's the best way to make racial progress in the United States. The first answer for African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinx, young people was organizing. We gave them like a list of 13. The second response for African American young people, 18 to 36, was what? Revolution. Hey. Right? So they could have picked elections, they could have picked federal elections and local elections. This might sound silly to some people, but what they're saying is if you're talking about real change, it ain't about electing somebody. It's about organizing folks. And if that don't work, it's about something more, a revolution. Let's take young people seriously. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, everyone. I think, well, maybe I want to end by saying, like, you know, I shared my story earlier about the work we were doing in Miami around the school to prison pipeline and even around black infant mortality. And sure, we collected our own data, but it really shouldn't have taken that. It should have taken one baby dying for this hospital to take action. It should have taken one young person getting suspended or expelled from school or arrested in school. But unfortunately, you know, going back to the ideological shifts and changes that we need to make, it did require us to do that as part of a larger organizing strategy. And I think for us, you know, we're called Data for Black Lives. Our focus is on data. It's about building the leadership of scientists and activists. It's about, you know, finding new ways to take these emerging technologies and actually turn it into something revolutionary. But really, you know, our focus is really on um, life, right? Protecting the sanctity and, and the value of black life, right? Of really, really, really um, using data as a way to honestly make bold demands, using the datification of our society to make bold demands for racial justice. Not new demands, but to make bold demands, right? It's amazing how we're able to talk about infant mortality or school or health issues in a whole different way. Um, because we've added this data piece to it. But a lot of it is, again, rooted in the organizing that I've done and that folks in, in this room are continuing to do. So that's really what it's about. And I think I would just close by maybe saying something about your last question, which is how do we get the information out? And so I would say that both for folks in the room and for folks on the feed, um, and I said this before, like, we have a lot of improvement we have to, to do in terms of our ability to get the information out. And sometimes we get it, we do get it out in the way that's not most useful uh, for people uh, to be able to integrate into the work that they're doing on the ground. Um, and so we try to popularize what we're doing. We do, you know, infographics and we do briefings and um, we're gonna try to start doing um, webinars, um, but even that isn't most useful. Right, and so I think that what's, what, what really is important is we think about kind of what is the, the partnership uh, that we are all in collectively. Pe pe folks talked on um, yesterday's panel about there is no room where we're all in it struggling together. There is also no room in which we're having this conversation about how do we use the information that we know to be true about our people to actually uh, develop strategy um, and, and do our work in the best possible way. So I think that maybe one of the takeaways coming out is that that is something that we can think about doing. And it is, I would say, if, if, if folks, we have a lot of information and we don't, we don't have to use it all. Uh, like there's a lot of data um, inherent in the in the research that we've done, and so if there's any way in which we can help people think about what they might need for the work that they are um, going to be doing over um, this cycle or across into because I think there's census is important. It's going to happen at the same time that the primaries are happening. Then we're going to have this election, and then there's going to be redistricting. And so our ability to think about all of that. And what we need to understand to be able to you know, move our communities is important. And so I would ask for feedback this way also in terms of what we can do to be most useful uh, for people's work. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Let's thank our panelists. Thank I just want to do another thank you for the panelists, Tracy, Adrian, Yeshi, and Kathy. This was an incredible beginning of the morning on a Sunday <laughs> data panel. Don't tell me it's not interesting. <laughs> so we're going to have just a quick lunch break. It's down the room in the Menentia room, and then we're going to, I think I got that name right, but I'm not positive. Menentia. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> down there. And uh, we're going to come back at 1 o'clock for the sea change in racial politics in the electoral arena. 
Um, and then Mo, we're gonna, you've been, you know, sitting back there probably thinking all kinds of things, so we can't wait to hear you on that panel with others. So um, thank you all. Um, please stay around, grab some lunch, and then uh, come back at one o'clock. We'll be ready to go at one.